to truly believe in the magic. What's up, Magic fans? Welcome to this week's episode of Let's Talk Magic, an Orlando Magic podcast. Now, today we're delighted to have a returning guest uh, tonight in Orlando Magic CEO, Alex Martins. Uh, so we're very much looking forward to speaking to Alex very shortly. Uh, but without further ado, I'm joined by my two northern friends, Mr. Bacon. How are we, sir? Very well, thank you, my friend. All good here. Yourself? Good, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Nice to be back on the pod. I've missed the last two because obviously it was yeah. away with my dad's 70th, so uh, missed your company. Partying hard? Partying hard, as always, as always. It's got to be done, hasn't it? So uh, here we go. Uh, and Mr. Gary Craggs, first of all, mate, big congratulations to you. Um, your your black cat beating my bluebirds on uh, Saturday, just gone two 0 Yeah, they made up for it after that, though, didn't they? <laughs> what happened? What happened after that? Remind me. I'm not, I'm not even going to go into it. <laughs> oh. I'm not even going to go into it. Gee, you can't do that. That's no, not, sorry, that's mate. Not sorry, sorry, you mate. Can't sorry. do that. That's below the belt. I know. Sorry, mate. Sorry, mate. Well, we 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 rebounded ourselves, but we won. So it's three points each, I guess, isn't it? But you got bragging rights, mate. It is. I'll just what I'll do is I'll do that, like the Vincent Tan hand. hand yeah, class. yeah, do that, do that. <laughs> but you I all know mate? You yeah, I'm all, all right. the better for seeing the Welsh wizard back. Ah, good man, good man, good. So um, let's get into it. Um, so since you you both uh, recorded last week, uh, we've played four games, uh, which included the end to our longest home stand on the season, uh, and we had one game out west last night. Um, in that time, the Magic went three and one, losing one close game to the LA Clippers by a score of one hundred to ninety-seven, uh, followed by a blowout win over the Memphis Grizzlies. Uh, as the home stand ended uh, with a very, very lackluster one hundred and four, one hundred and three win over the Portland Trail Blazers. Um, we did see a, a game last night, uh, which saw the Magic dig deep and beat the New Orleans Pelicans. Uh, in what was a bit of an intense playoff style matchup, uh, with it getting quite chippy. Um, so a couple of points just to to pick up on. Um, firstly, we've got to talk about the Portland game because ugh, that that was painful to watch. Uh, but you know, kudos to the the Blazers for scrapping, playing their game. But this was one that we you know felt that we should have put away. It almost felt like a you know like a an animal playing with his prey and just not putting it away sort of thing. Um, but we were just one DeAndre eight and 12 footer from losing that game. Uh, but we did win. Um, but how concerned were you with that performance? I come to you, Paul, obviously we did bounce back last night, but what were your thoughts, mate? Cause I know you compared it to your Leeds uh, game yeah. against Hull on Monday night. I, I, I think <laughs> that game looked like one where, they, I'm not going to say they expected to win it, but it was almost, I think the phrase I used to you was that they were playing the record as opposed to the team in front of them. And I think that's probably one of the few times we've seen it this season. Um, I'll be honest with you, I'm not over-concerned. We got away with it. We got the W, move on. But I kind of feel at this moment in time that we have had, you know, with the with the the games that we've had in the in the Kia Center, the, the Clippers being the the latter one of the group of three Western teams that came in, big teams that we'd got to face, who were all fighting for something. It was almost as if in came Portland after the Memphis game, but in came Portland, and the team almost relaxed. The this mm -hmm. is the back end of this. We've we've got this one, and the kind of wasn't that need to to try to to raise your performance, which I get can be difficult against something that is perceived to be a lesser opponent. It nearly backfired. Thankfully, it didn't. But I th I think overall recently we've seen the team having so many games that have been almost like playoff experience. Uh, you know, we've in the Golden State came in, they had something to play for. The Clippers came in, they had something to play for. Um, and again, facing New Orleans last night, 
both teams had a massive amount to play for. And the, those games, I felt that with the Pelicans one last night, we we'd actually learnt how to deal with some of that playoff like pressure. Yeah. Um, so. Yes, some of the results hadn't necessarily been the best. A couple of the performances hadn't been the best, but I felt quite positive in that I think it's more just a case of a little bit of relaxation against a team that they shouldn't have done in Portland. Mm -hmm. And then when, when we went into Smoothie King last night and got that huge win, it was a huge win. Let's not pretend... Um, that was one of those games where you looked and thought, you guys actually learned how to handle this pressure and get a win in that pressure situation. And it was good to see. So but, overall, I mean, not too worried, mate. Not too worried. But in those in those three losses against those, you know, playoff calibre teams out West, you know, a couple of possessions, that's all it was. A couple yeah, of free absolutely. throws here and there. And you, know, you know, you put every, everyone sort of getting a little bit down upon it, but... We're there or thereabouts. It's just... I'm gonna. The other thing I've I've mentioned it in in previous pods, but let's let's. Last season, for those of who are who don't follow football soccer, we I apologise, but we saw an Arsenal team last year in the top at the top of, top of the Premiership, in a position where they could easily have gained their this young squad, their first title, and they had a wobble. They had a lack of experience to follow that through. And I've kind of felt in the last few weeks that this is what we've been seeing with the Magic, a young team that is learning how to win in pressure situations. Yeah. Um, and unlike in a, in a single league system where at the end of the season, you are the winner, we, we're fighting for a playoff position. So some of those results, they may have affected your standing ultimately in the playoffs, but they haven't affected your ability to be in contention yeah. for the final prize. Um, and I think, I, I, I felt watching last night that they've learned to handle some of that pressure in those sorts of games, keep composure and get a W. And I thought, I... I I'm not concerned. I'm happy. I'm good. Good, good, good. Um, so, so in that game, uh, Coach Jamal Mosley recorded his hundredth career win at uh, the Portland game now uh, for the Magic, joining Brian Hill, uh, um, who's got two hundred and sixty-seven wins, Stan Van Gundy two hundred and fifty-nine, Doc Rivers one seven one, and Matty Gukas with one hundred and eleven in the hundred hundred win club. He's obviously got one hundred and one now following the the win against the Pelicans last night. Um, but Gary, are there any sort of standout moments for for you during Mosley's tenure as head coach? I think you've got to, first of all, just look at the three seasons overall and see the leap that's been taken. I know we, we had David Steele on last week. I mean, Paul felt incredibly fortunate to have that time with him. But it's been an evolution because when we appointed Jamal Mosley in, the initial fear was let's not go down the um, the Jacques Vaughan route again where we get a, a coach in who's got a lot of hype, who speaks well, who we hope is going to be something, but then materialises where they're not. And I think Mosley's had the time, but even in season one, you could see he was a lot more than that. Um, he's evolved. David Steele was saying about, you know, he's grown with the team. He's gone from being a relationships coach, someone who has been wise enough to know he's in a rebuild. And it's been about developing almost a culture when we saw the ring and the bell, the father-like figure being young enough to still be in touch with the team. And then as it is, as the magic have evolved, so has Jamal Mosley. So I think we were probably very right in season one where he got that time, but there were times early on where you would think, oh, that, that final play wasn't great, that final possession. That was quite frequent, possibly down to players, but also possibly the position that Jamal Mosley found himself in. But we've seen, and I know David still shone a spotlight on it, but it really, after the Portland game, we saw the change in what would have been year one Jamal Mosley to where we are now, where the expectations changed, the 
the magic. We were sat here. We could be the second seed. That's a possibility yeah. at this time of recording. But there's now expectation. And he, he called out. It was it was a poor performance. And he called out the team in a press conference, which is not really a Jamal Mosley thing to do, and talked about a standard and expectation that we didn't hit that night, even though it was a win. And then I think really to see the difference from year one, relationships, coaching, arm around the shoulder, building a mentality with like the bell players and things like that to where we are now, that growth with a lot of that unit, look at the reaction we got against the Pelicans. If that was a team that didn't respect its coach, and I'm taught, I'm saying respect, not like, because I think it's two totally different things. When, when you look at, yeah. I'll look at things from a teaching angle all the time, and that's effectively what he's doing in some respect. It's not about being like, it's about being respected. The like and couldn't come after that. And Mosley to get that reaction against the Pelicans, because they were up for that. And the Pelicans have basically mirrored us in terms of form, in terms of where they are in their conference, in terms of what they've got on the line going into the end of the season. To get that reaction in what was we've said is a chippy game, we were more physical than them, we were more up for it than them, and it's because the players were playing, I believe, for the coach and the fact that he basically went, this is what's on the line here, things have changed. And that was a different energy to what we got against Portland. It was chalk and cheese in those games. And then uh, Chauncey Billups said after the Portland game that at some point people are going to start talking about Jamal Mosley as coach of the year. I saw one of our Patreon members, Dylan, mention this on uh, on X or Twitter or whatever you want to call it. And it might not happen this season because of what's happened in OKC. But when we've seen some jobs become available this year, we've worried about whether people are going to look at Mosley. The Lakers jobs being like talked about will it come vacant at the end of the season. They'll be looking at Jamal Mosley. He'd be silly to go there, but they'll be looking. And that's a testament. People don't look at coaches who aren't good when they're in jobs. Yeah. They, they look at ones who are excelling. And he's one of a handful of young coaches right now who are excelling. And he's got the, what stands out to me is how from year one to right now, he has built that culture and he's, he has evolved as the team has evolved and as expectations evolved. And he's also managing young stars and they are still doing it for him, which is a good sign. Yeah. Anything to add to that, Paul? Or I, I, on, if, if, yeah, absolutely. Um, I can only express it in the difference when you walk into a Magic game from a few years back. Uh, I, I've i not been this season. You've had the benefit of going this season, G. I understand that. So you will probably be better able to expand on this. But when we went opening night of last season, even at that point, there was a... You felt a belief in the team that they could go out and compete. Uh, then when Golden State came in, yes, you looked at that game and they were going to fight tooth and nail and had bought in entirely to the coach's belief of we build this from defence, we work hard and good things will come. Uh, that would be my standout of how we are under Jamal. But... <laughs> He is exceptional. I think I'm not going to expand on what Gary said because it's absolutely bang on what he yeah. the way he's expressed yeah. it. Yeah. But for me, that moment of walking into a building and watching the team that you support and seeing such a difference in attitude. Yeah. Press and pride. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I love the guy for that. Yeah. Here's a, I've got a question just totally off the cuff here on the back of what Paul said there. And it's for both of you. So sorry, I'm putting you on the spot. But we've seen some pretty lean years. We've been through some coaches in our time in I am Orlando as Orlando fans. How often do we go into games now where you think we are going to get owned on the coaching side? I, I don't Not think often it happens, as well. Not often, no. Uh, there's, yeah. there's points where we all look and think, mm, yeah. could he have challenged that one? Have we, you know, the Clippers <laughs> game, I guess, was one where we all looked and went, you've got 20 seconds to go, why not? I don't know whether you can. I'm not going to lie. I don't know whether he can, but why not? Could he have challenged the 
out of bounds call on Paul George. I think the explanation there was he only had one timeout left, so we'd have lost the timeout had we lost the I'd challenge. I'd have rather burnt it. Yeah, because we would have won the, 20 yeah, seconds I mean, left. the last two-minute report said that we should have had yeah. it. So, yeah. Regardless of that, it's 20 seconds. How many more ti- How many more opportunities are you going to get to use that timeout? So, from a yeah. personal point of view, I would rather us have burnt it and challenged it and not take yeah. and rolled the dice on the on the chance of it getting overturned. Whether mm-hmm. or not we now look back and see that the last you said the last two minute report said it was an, it was an error. Mm-hmm. I would have rather him rolled the dice there and then. But these are personal preferences. And that guy is infinitely more qualified than some idiot sat in Mansfield as a fan <laughs> who just talks occasionally about basketball. That man works it. I will respect his decision. 100%. But yeah, you don't feel it, do you? You don't feel that we're going to get owned. No, no, no you don't. Right, let's uh, have a, a quick uh, word from our sponsors, Attraction Tickets. Um, so it's just a quick break to tell you about today's partner, um, if you're looking for tickets uh, and hotels for the world's best theme parks and attractions, do check out Attraction Tickets. They are the UK's number one attraction ticket provider for Walt Disney World, Universal Studios, SeaWorld, Disneyland Paris and other popular attractions. Attraction Tickets also sell Orlando Magic tickets at hugely competitive prices. So when you're booking your next holiday, please use our link in the description and see what they have to offer. You can also uh, use our website, letstalkmagic.com, for all our affiliate links and discount codes, including the NBA store and Fanatics. Uh, so without further ado, uh, we'll get into our interview with uh, Alex Martins. Uh, now we're joined by a very special guest, a man who needs no introduction, uh, but he's going to get one anyways. Uh, so he's been with the team since the very beginning in 1989, having served in several senior management positions and he currently holds the role of Chief Executive Officer of the Orlando Magic. Mr. Alex Martins, how are we, sir? I'm great. How are you, gentlemen? Great to be back with you again. Oh, well, it's an honor you so to have much. you. Thank you. We're, we're very well, thank you, Alex. Uh, other than the rain uh, in Wales here, I'm sure you're, you've got sunnier climates there in Florida. Well, we, we've got a beautiful day today, but oh. we had uh, a whale type day yesterday, so... <laughs> we're, we're happy to see the sun today brilliant brilliant Killing yeah us. it's, it's the only way the to be living yeah i know i know um so we were fortunate enough to have you uh on our podcast a few years ago uh where we got to know a little bit about yourself what you did with your role etc so um i'll kick it off um tonight and, and just ask about the in-game experience um at the kia center it's obviously got uh, many great experiences within the arena for fans uh, with the Hall of Fame. Uh, the, the concourse is filled with a history of the franchise uh, amongst, you know, other elements. Um, I was over in February, uh, very fortunate to uh, meet my favourite player, Mark L. Fultz, uh, which was an absolutely uh, amazing experience, uh, one I'll never forget. Um, so just brought me on, really, to um, ask the question about the fan experience um, for the organisation, and, and getting people to return, um, especially with many tourists frequenting games and a lot from the UK. So, so what's important for the organization, you know, in terms of fan experience? Well, the fan experience is really one of our uh, primary elements of importance for uh, our game, our games and, and, and what we do in our business. You know, one of our four core values as an organization is legendary and what we mean by legendary is that we want everyone that interacts with our organization to have a legendary type experience to have an excellent experience and so we really focus on that and it goes back to really the day that we opened what was the old amway center now kia center right as as we have renamed our building but uh we partnered with you know one of our great companies here in town and one of our team partners in Disney, who really, you know, has the expertise of customer service like no one else does. If you've ever been to Disney, you know, you you see that extra special customer service experience. And so when we opened the building, uh, we asked our friends at Disney to come and train every one of our employees, uh, full-time, part-time, anyone that interacts with our guests, ushers, ticket takers, uh, anyone, you know, in our food and beverage concessions, et cetera. And they went through a multi-day training 
uh, the Disney way, if you will. And, and then ever since that time, at the beginning of every season, uh, we have the Disney team come back and do shorter training. You know, it's typically a few hours, but to refresh all of our employees in the arena uh, on the customer service experience, because it's that important to us. You know, we recognize that, you know, in sports, uh, there are ups and downs. Fortunately, we're on an up right now, and hopefully we'll stay there for a while. But, you know, in recent times, you know, the team wasn't quite as competitive on the floor. And our whole attitude was, we want people to come to our building, have a great time, and win or lose, they leave the building saying, that was a great experience, right? And, and so this Disney training has helped us, the training of our employees, our approach to uh, all of our fans in the building. And then ultimately, you know, we were really pleased, you know, a few years ago uh, to win the international award for customer experience of all sporting uh, buildings. And then this past year, uh, we were recognized as the number one customer experience in all of the NBA. Uh, so it's that important to us. We really focus on it. And uh, again, we want people to come to our building, win or lose, and have a great time so that they will want to come back again often. That's that's awesome. I would say I've seen at games in other arenas. I've been to New York, I've been to Toronto, and I've been to Orlando, and it's it's far and away better in Orlando. And it's not to knock the others; they were good, but Orlando is a cut above. Um, well, thank you, massively, absolutely thank massive. You. Um, thank you, so Alex. Alex, we've seen them um, with the growth of social media and such. We get to see the war room now on draft night. We get to yeah. see the magic call picks. We yeah. hear about players coming into town for pre-draft workouts on their social right. media. But for you, what's the draft day and the process look like in recent years? So so for me, um, the draft day process, and really as it relates to all of our basketball operations, is to provide the support to our basketball leadership um, so that, number one, they have the tools that they need to be successful. And number two, provide them the support to you know, allow them to make the decisions that they feel are necessary for our team on the floor to be successful. Uh, so you you may or may not know, you know, one of my big jobs over the course of the last, you know, three or four or five years has been to uh, study, design, develop, construct, and ultimately open really the most state-of-the-art training facility in the NBA. Uh, the Advent Health Training Facility, we opened it up uh, a little over a year ago, a year and a half ago, I guess now. And it's really recognized as uh, the best training facility in all of the NBA. And, and so with that as our foundation, uh, we utilize that obviously as a recruiting tool when we bring players in for you know, their pre-draft workouts uh, to set ourselves apart from everyone else. But it also is the home for our basketball operations team. And that's where they they work every day. That's where they strategize every day. And ultimately, that's where we hold the draft. Okay. And for me, my role is to provide them with those tools and to give them the support to help them make to be successful. Uh, of course, you know, I, I sit in on the draft workouts. I, I'm there on draft day uh, to, you know, provide support to Jeff Weltman. You know, our, our president of basketball operations and, and our entire basketball operations team as they go through their decision making process. Uh, and then ultimately to communicate to our ownership uh, about our direction, uh, the direction that we want to go in, and ultimately the decisions that our basketball team uh, makes in order to put those pieces in place, to add those pieces uh, on draft night and throughout the entire year. So, again, as CEO, my role is to give everyone the tools to be able to do their job, to be successful, um, and ultimately to be there to support them and, uh, you know, agree with them uh, on the decisions that they make from a player personnel standpoint. Worked well. It, it, it's really interesting where we get to see some of these things now on social media, whereas before they were all shrouded in mystery. Yeah, and yeah. I think that kind of leads me on to, the question I want to ask around um, the 
the interactions that the team have and how Nike decide on the designs and the and the classic look that the fans all want. Um, what is the process and the input that the team have in regards to, say, something like the City jersey, which has been so well received this year and the, and the throwback? Yeah, the yeah. Classic. So a lot to unpack there, Paul. You know, I'd, I'd love to touch on your point about social media because it has become a huge part of our business, right? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it, it's 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 funny, but also, you know, it was a, a, a goal of ours, a focus of ours uh, about two years ago. You know, overall, when it comes to social media, we were at the bottom of the league in terms of engagements, in terms of followers all across, you know, the social platforms. And, and we put a strategy in place at that time to say, look, we need to improve upon this. You know, we're great in ticket sales. We're great in customer service. Uh, we're great in so many things, but we need to be great in, in social media as well. So we beefed up our team. We brought in a lot of experts. And today, you know, we're proud to say that we're number six overall in the NBA in terms of our social media engagement and followers, et cetera. Um, but to the point of, you know, the, the uniform selection and, and Nike and, you know, social media plays a role in all of that, right? Because uh, our, our fans, we want to get our fans feedback, you know, as to what they like, what they dislike, what have been their favorites over the years. So a lot of input goes into making those decisions about what we do in terms of uniforms. And, you know, the, the, the uniform program today is more extensive than it ever has been in my 35 years in the NBA. And a big part of that is Nike. You know, Nike came on board a few years ago. Uh, I guess they re-engaged as our uniform provider, uh, and our and I guess I guess you all would call it the kit, right? <laughs> our, yeah, our kit yes. provider. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know uh, what what they've done is you know they they bring the power and the creativity of Nike, uh, you know, and this huge sports apparel brand, and so. The way it starts is, you know, it really is a collaborative effort between Nike and the league office and our team at the Orlando Magic. Okay, and uh, you know, there's there's city edition uniform that you know basically now changes every year and sort of has a platform for two or three years at a time. So you can relate to the example, Paul. I can see the orange and anthracite banner right. behind, yes. you know, over your shoulder there. So we went through that three-year period where we really went off the board, right? And and we went away from our traditional colors, and we decided to sort of uh, steep into the history and tradition of our community. So Orlando, you know, has long been recognized, and 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 really, you know, its early years as a community was steeped in the citrus industry and oranges, and and so. We wanted to play off of that. We wanted to play off of our sunshine. And so during that decision-making process, you know, we decided to go off the board with the orange and the anthracite and, and do something different. But it really all starts with the creative team at Nike. You know, they come up with, uh, you know, a few ideas for us to sort of start thinking about some themes. Um, our creative team internally works with them to say, okay, this is... Uh, sort of a, a, a focus of our community right now, or this is an idea that we have based on the history of our community, based on the history of the franchise. And then the creative process starts. I mean, ultimately, uh, the creative team at Nike designs the uniform based on the input that their creative team and our creative team, um, you know, create together. Um, and then we have an internal committee you know, with, which is a combination of our marketing team, our, our creative team, uh, you know, some, you know, representation from our ownership. And we go through this process that, believe it or not, you know, when we're creating a new uniform, we start that process over three years in advance of when you ever see the uniform, right? Yeah. And it starts then and we go through many iterations and, you know, it goes back and forth between us and and, and, and Nike and the league office, which participates in the process as well. And, you know, we at the end of the day, we try to create a story, right? A story around this series of uniforms that, as you can, as you see now, 
is not just about the uniform, but now we have a court, you know, yeah. that coincides with the uniform when we wear those city edition uniforms on our city edition nights, for example. Uh, and, and we also have other courts that coincide with our, you know, our, our other uniform uh, uniforms that we wear during the year as well. So it really is a, a process that takes many years, takes a lot of creative people with input. Um, and, and ultimately, it's about, you know, creating a brand and a uniform that our fans would be proud of, would be our, our fans would be proud of wearing and ultimately investing in. Um, and, and look, there's the retail component of it all as well, right? And, and so, you know, selling jerseys is part of our business. Selling the kits are part of our business, right? And, um, and, and so that, that process has worked really well with Nike, you know, uh, over the last several years. And uh, I personally am, am really proud of, you know, the designs that we've come up with, you know, particularly in the City Edition uh, uh, uniform line. Have you had a particular favorite? of those jerseys well i i mean one of my favorites is this year's city edition yeah. uniform I, I mean i love it you know it it's sort of um it, it's a little bit different you know than our typical color scheme but it, it really has sort of a a look back at uh, history and tradition of our organization as well and you know having been here 30 of the 35 years i've seen most of our uniforms over you know the course of time and, uh, I, you know, I, I particularly like, you know, our, our, our city edition one this year. And I love our classic jersey, you know, the, the one that really, um, you know, pays homage to. And of course, it's because of our 35th anniversary that we've done this pays homage to our heart and hustle team. You know, that team that Daryl Armstrong and, and Bo Outlaw played on was one of our favorite, our fans favorite teams over the years. Um, and I, I've always loved that jersey as well. We're really going to miss those, uh, Alex. Yeah, I'll let yeah, you know we are. that. <laughs> we are. I think I think this year's jerseys, I, I, the the way this the the kingdom on the rise um, iteration of the jerseys that we've had has just dovetailed in so well with how this team has you know drafting Paolo and where we have gone from there. It's yeah, it's, it's so exciting this period of time. Yeah, well, well, Paul, look as I said. Those things are designed years in advance. Yep. So ultimately, this year's jersey was designed years before we drafted Paolo. So as we like to say sometimes, it's better to be, to be lucky than to be good. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say it was always the intention that you no, knew where it was going. Of course it was. Of course. Of course. <laughs> I would add to that as well. I know um, the guys have seen this, but when the City jersey arrived this year, I think that was the first one who had arrived to in terms of delivery. And I, I yeah. sent a message and I went, the photographs don't do this justice. Yeah. To, to you're, you're right. I mean, they, they do they do come off more impressive in person than they do in the photographs or on television, et cetera. Um, yeah. But that, you know, that's the great thing about live sports that you get to see it in person, right? Yeah, oh, but absolutely, it's my absolute favorite this year. Okay. I think that's coinciding with the team. Um, Alex, obviously, we're looking forward to the future a bit here. But um, when all said and done, how would you like your legacy to be remembered in both Orlando and in the wider NBA community? Well, um, you know, I'd like to think that hopefully we'd be recognized as innovators. Um, you know, we've really tried, you know, throughout our time here to. Um, not to do things the way that they've always been done, you know, to try to be not just current, but forward thinking and forward looking. And so, you know, as it relates to our business operations, you know, we've, we've been leaders um, in innovation and we've been leaders in, you know, everything from, you know, dynamic ticket pricing to our game presentation uh, to, as we mentioned earlier, you know, the customer service approach. Um, so, you know, one thing I, I, you know, I'd certainly hope that we be looked at as, as innovators and leaders, you know, in our league. Um, you know, we've worked real hard to be great supporters of our commissioner, Adam Silver, and, and his team at the league office and, you know, have played a leadership role, you know, many times in things like, you know, our, our, our media and television, you know, negotiations and our, our collective bargaining negotiations. So hopefully, 
an element of having provided leadership to the league, you know, overall, um, you know, over the years. And then finally, you know, hopefully, you know, a great community leader for Orlando and, you know, to be seen as, um, you know, not just a team that plays here, but a team that gives back both from a philanthropic standpoint, but also from a leadership standpoint and that, you know, we participated in a lot of the big events and a lot of, you know, the, the big things that have happened in our community. You know, Orlando's changed a lot, you know, since we first came here. Uh, back in 1989, when, the, when the, the team first started, the population of the general Orlando area is probably about 750,000 people. You know, today, the population of the general Orlando area is over two and a half million. So our community has grown tremendously. And for us to be looked at as participating in helping that growth and in, in helping to, uh, you know, make our community a great place to live and to work and to play and to enjoy, um, you know, hopefully that's part of the legacy. You know, we participated just last night in a great announcement. Um, our industry's uh, primary media publication in the United States, the Sports Business Journal, you may be familiar with it. Um, but it, it's the primary trade publication for the sports industry here in the States, recognized Orlando as the number one sports destination in all of the United States. OK, and I'd like to think that we have played a role in that, you know, and that we played a role and we were the first major professional sports team, you know, to come to the city of Orlando. But we've also played a, ro a big role in the leadership of bringing all these big major sporting events to Orlando, whether it's, um, you know, it, international uh, football competitions, as you would say, uh, soccer, as, as we say here, um, and, you know, the friendlies that have come here, and, you know, the major uh, teams that have come here from the Premier League over the years and are coming again this summer, or whether it's, you know, the MLS, you know, having come here or the major college football, major, major college basketball um, and that's why, you know, the Sports Business Journal named us as the number one sports destination, um, you know, in their publication this week. And we celebrated that last night with them. But my point is, our hope is that we played a big role in, in growing the sports ecosystem, you know, here in Central Florida and to help our community be recognized as, you know, the number one city in all of the states, you know, when it comes to sports uh, destination and sports competition. So, you know, those are a few things at, at the end of the day, you know, I hope that, you know, I've, I've helped to make our community a better place that I I've helped to make our league a better league. And then ultimately that I helped the Orlando magic become, you know, one of the, the, the best operated uh, organizations and franchises in the NBA. Awesome. Finals winners. Yeah, well, well, that's that's the one piece. That, that's the one piece that we're still looking for, and hopefully, uh, before my time is done, I'll be able to enjoy that. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, just to follow on on that, um, you look at the team certainly allow players to express themselves as well. It was it, last night in the commentary from uh, the game. David and uh, Jeff were saying about Wendell um, starting a uh, curriculum in respect of, uh, I think it was a flying school, wasn't it? Um, huge things that, that the that the players are able, not just the organisation, but the players are encouraged to give back as well. And uh, kudos to the team for that because it's it's so important. Um, I want to come to something that's happened this year, and Garant, you were over for this, weren't you, my friend? I was, I was. Very um, the decision to start retiring jerseys uh, was something different for the Magic themselves. And I was just wondering how this came about for the team. Uh, and then second part is how easy was the choice to take Shaq as the inaugural player? Well, you know, I I think these decisions always have the right time is the way I would put it. And, you know, we never felt like the right time had come up until this year to make that type of decision. And maybe it's the 35th anniversary that mm. sort of spurred our, 
you know, our, our desire to, to start looking in this direction. You know, we've had so many great players over the years to have played for this franchise. And obviously several of them have taken us to the NBA finals twice. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, we've talked about it for years and we've never thought it was the right time. And uh, as we started looking ahead a little over a year ago, um, we felt like it was it was the time to to do it and to really start, you know, in terms of uh, recognizing forward players uh, in really the grandest way that an organization can uh, to do it here in the States, and that's to retire their number. And so after we made that decision to ultimately, you know, retire the first number, who it was going to be was the easy part. Um, you know, Shaq, Shaq put the, the Orlando Magic on the map. You know, I mean, Shaq is a cultural icon. You know, he's one of the uh, greatest players ever in the history, you know, of the NBA to have played the game. He's won several championships, unfortunately not one with us, but, you know, has won several championships. And, and uh, you know, he, he's obviously in the Basketball Hall of Fame. But he really was the person to put us on the map very early, you know, in our history. Um, of course, we, we only started back in 1989 and we draft, you know, Shaq uh, just a, a few years after that. And before you know it, you know, he takes us with, you know, the rest of our team to the NBA finals in 1995, really one of the fastest franchises in NBA history in terms of their inception to getting to the NBA finals. And, he really was our leader, um, and uh, you know it, it, it was an easy decision, you know, to to make him the fir very first one. And um, you know, it was a great evening. Um, you know, it, it was just touching in that uh, so many of his former teammates came back for the ceremony, and some of them for, for the very first time since they had left us as players, uh, and every one of them, you know, were just so. Uh, appreciative to be there and so excited to be part of the ceremony. And, you know, if you watch the ceremony, I mean, Shaq was number one, very much touched by it all. Um, you know, it was a very emotional night for him. But, you know, it was great to see the words that were spoken by Shaq to people like Penny Hardaway and by Penny Hardaway to Shaq. And it, it just showed the bond and um, you know, the greatness that we had on that team. So it was just a spectacular night. I mean, to this day, you know, I still get uh, notes from people around the NBA and from the league office about how great a ceremony it was and how great it was, you know, for the franchise and for Shaq. So anyway, it one of the, I would say one of the, you know, top moments of my career to have been involved with. And uh, I, I know that Shaq, you know, really, really will hold that night. Uh, very close to his heart, you know, for the rest of his life. So, you know, right time, right person, I guess, is the short answer. You've actually just answered it. I was going to have a follow-up question on this and ask you how it felt to be involved. And you've actually just answered that because uh, we asked David Steele the same question last week and he said it was a very special night to be a part of. And uh, you've just said the same thing there. Yeah, you know, for those of us that were here at that time and look, it, it a lot of time has passed, right? I mean, that was, you know, back in the mid nineties. Um, but for those of us that were here, that was a very special time in our careers. You know, I always like to say that at the time, by the way, you know, and I think we've probably talked about this a couple of years ago, but at that time I was, I was the public relations director for the team. You know, it was my first role with the team. I'd just, uh, you know, been with the team a few years and I traveled with the team full time. You know, during that period of time when Shaq and 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 Penny and and Dennis Scott and the rest of the crew, you know, were on the team, and I always say when you know recounting our our time, you know, together at that time and what we went through, honestly, it was like traveling with the Beatles. You know, I mean, they were uh, popular everywhere we went. We would show up at hotels after games on back to back games at two or three o'clock in the morning, and we've had we'd have hundreds of fans in whatever city it was, Sacramento, Portland, Seattle at that time, what have you, um, waiting outside of our hotel room to show up just to catch a glimpse or hopefully to catch an autograph. 
um, it, it was a very special time. Um, and, and for those of us, you know, who were with a brand new franchise that had just started in 1989, we were like, oh, this is what it's like all the time, huh? <laughs> uh, but, uh, but as we know, you know, sports are cyclical. And, uh, but, but those of us that are here, you know, David and I and uh, people like, you know, Joel Glass and, and a few others that were here at the time, um, you know, we look back on those days really fondly and we were able to celebrate um, you know, the players and the coaches that made it happen. Uh, it, it's a really special night for us. And that was a really special night indeed. Yeah, absolutely. It was. And, you know, to be part of that, uh, of that night, having traveled over was, you know, something I'll remember forever um, being there, but even the lead up to it, Alex, you know, when, when you got to go on TNT and put the call into Shaq, that was a lot of fun. Um, you know, and the media spotlight then was on the magic, um, so that, that brings me on nicely, actually, to, to my next question. So obviously the team's shown, uh, you know, continued growth in the last two seasons. This season, with, with, you know, with wins jumping up from 22 to 34. Now we've got 45 with six games uh, remaining on, on the schedule. Um, is there a feeling that we've not had enough national media coverage around the team's improvement or the fact that, you know, Paolo uh, was Rookie of the Year Given the fact that we've had one national media game, which in in touch with you know, in fact, was the Shaquille uh, game against the OKC Thunder um, in the last two seasons. Whereas you've got the you know, I'm nitpicking here maybe, but the San Antonio Spurs are on all the time because of Victor Wembanyama. Um, is there some frustration surrounding this, and um, and any dialogue between you know, the, the Magic and ESPN or, or the league itself? Uh, the answer is yes and yes. Um, <laughs> <simply> <laughs> but, Maybe not. <laughs> but, but but having but having said that, in, in all fairness, um, look, I, I don't think anyone um, would have expected us to make the leap this year that we've made. Um, and, and I would say, from our perspective, even from our perspective, the leap the leap that we've made. Um, has surpassed our expectations internally as well. You know, I mean, if you had asked me at the beginning of the season, you know, what I would have seen as a successful year as compared to last year, if we had won 39 games, I would have been ecstatic, okay? And here we are with six to play, as you say, with 45 wins. Um, you know, the opportunity still at this stage to potentially finish second or third in the yeah. Eastern Conference um, you know, I don't think anybody expected that, uh, including ourselves. I mean, if we're going to be honest with ourselves, right? I mean, we you always hope for it, but you never know. You know, I mean, we always say, Jeff Weltman likes to say, you know, the players will tell you what type of team you have, okay? And the players have told us this year what type of team we have. And it's, I think, better than most people expected, right? So when the schedule makers make the schedule, First of all, you know, give you a sort of a little bit of behind the scenes. The schedule process for the following year starts almost the week that the current season begins. Okay, so we actually started this year's schedule process a year ago, October. Okay, and that's when we start submitting dates to the league that are available in our building. And that's when the league starts talking to, television partners, et cetera. So my point being that um, when this year's schedule was being formulated, it was at the very beginning of Paulo Bancaro's Rookie of the Year year. Okay. okay. Yeah. Now, obviously, as the year goes on, they start to adjust. And, you know, look, I mean, we, we had a good year last year. We made significant improvements. Obviously, Paulo had a Rookie of the Year type season. But by the time you get to the middle of last year, I think the networks and the league really start sort of molding the clay around the schedule, right? My point being is that um, I don't think anybody expected, you know, what we would have done this year and uh, how popular we would have been. And they set the schedule. And unfortunately, for the most part, there's not a whole lot of flexibility in the schedule once they set it. Um, my desire and what, you know, we've talked to the league about, and I think, you know, they're, they're talking to our 
national and international media partners about as we go through those negotiations currently for our new media deal is let's create more flexibility in the schedule, okay? So that if an Orlando Magic team this year gets off to a great start and looks like they may be, you know, one of the better teams in the East, you know, as you go through the year, you can flex some of their games onto the schedule, right? right. But the way that, you know, it's been formatted to date, it's very difficult to do that. And the league does move some games around, but it also comes down to when they have a game on a specific night, and I'm not going to use any teams in particular, but may not be as attractive as when they originally scheduled, you know, the schedule at the beginning of the year. For the Magic to be able to replace that game, first of all, we have to be playing on that night already, right? Yeah, right. And in addition to playing on that night, if you're going to put it on a national or international broadcast, we've got to be playing another good team, right? So just to put the Orlando Magic on against one of the poorer teams in the league, you're not replacing a, a, a mediocre game with a mediocre game, right? So, um, so anyway, it's it's a product of how the schedule is done. It's a product of how far in advance it's done, and maybe some inflexibility, right? So, our hope, you know, as we discuss it with the league and with our network partners, is that when we move into this new era of media and we move into the new schedule, that we create more flexibility, so that when these you know, occurrences happen, we have the ability to be on national television more. And to wrap it all back to your your point about the, the, you know, the Shaq announcement on TNT, of course, internally, we're always thinking of those opportunities mm -hmm. where we can put ourselves into some national exposure, even if we're not going to be on a national television game, right? And so that was one of those examples, you know, let's take advantage of Shaq being on TNT, He's on national television. Can we create some exposure for the Orlando Magic while also announcing this great, you know, uh, announcement of, of, of his jersey being retired uh, in a way that, you know, we can get onto national TV maybe when we're not on as much. So, look, I, I think moving forward, um, you know, it's, it's all dependent upon opponent. As we get into the playoffs, I think you're going to see a lot of, you know, Magic National TV, you know, as we get into the playoffs and certainly as we get into next year, I would certainly expect that the Magic will be on national TV a lot more um, than the one game that we were on this year. That's yeah. interesting because it kind of mirrors with, um, I don't know if anybody saw the interview that Draymond Green did on his own podcast about following his ejection in the Kia Centre. And he said about um, Golden State's game in Orlando is always a nightmare. It often comes on a back-to-back -back because it's always squeezed in because it's been, it's not been a game that has been carried on national TV, whereas often the sweep, the Florida sweep, as he called it, the game in Miami has yes. been. Right. And his words were, I, I, this is changing. I, I think, I think it's, yeah, I think this is about changing. to change. They, yeah, you, you, you might see a difference in that schedule next year. Yeah, that, so even the players are themselves talking about it and saying this is changing. So it was. I thought that was a really interesting interview that he actually did about visiting Orlando itself as a, as a yeah. as a player. Really yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. um, one of the um, projects you've been, you know, uh, very involved in uh, there, Alex, is the. Um, entertainment project downtown. Obviously, I, I was over in February. Um, What's what's the latest on that? Uh, whilst I was there, there was a, a, a lot of rumours. Uh, somebody mentioned to me maybe a magic hotel, which involved uh, tickets to the game, etc. I didn't know if it was just hearsay or whatnot. So uh, with the man on the pod, I thought I'd just throw it in there and ask you for an update, if you'd be so kind. Sure, sure. So, look, this is an exciting project that we've been working on for a long time. Uh, it was actually, you know, conceptualised before COVID. And uh, it really came about because the city of Orlando had had the police headquarters on the block immediately across the street from the then Kia Center, or then Amway Center, now Kia Center. Um, and the city had decided to relocate to a new location with a brand new police station. And so that 
property ultimately became available, you know, because the city had moved the, the police headquarters. And we went to ownership and said, look, you know, this piece of property right in front of our front door is, is going to become available. We think we should take advantage of that, right? And we should, you know, think about purchasing it and deciding how we control our front door, as we said at the time. And, you know, Rich DeVos was still, you know, alive at the time. And, you know, he absolutely said, yes, I mean, if, if we have the opportunity to control our front door, we need to do that. Okay. And so we purchased the land, you know, it took some time for the city to demolish the building, et cetera. We started looking at potential plans. And at that time, it was really the beginning of the boom of what now has become you know, sports and entertainment development around professional sports uh, buildings, stadiums, arenas here in the States. And I'm sure you've seen it in the UK as well. You know, sports owners are trying to take advantage of the mass of people that they bring to their arenas and to their stadiums, to their pitches, and, you know, develop that area around, you know, those facilities. And, and so we decided to do the same. And we engaged with the developer. We started do, doing some initial design. We talked to the city about approvals, et cetera. And then COVID hit, right? And COVID slowed, obviously, everything down. And the development, you know, industry, you know, was negatively impacted. And so anyway, fast forward to post-COVID. And we made the decision to, you know, find another development partner, which took some time. And now the project is really on fast forward. So the development partners that, you know, we have now are uh, the folks that developed the mixed use development outside of the Sacramento Kings arena, a company okay. by the name of JMA. They partnered with another company called Machete. Um, and so we've re-envisioned the project and we're now going through all of our city approvals, permitting, et cetera. And ultimately, you know, we're going to be in the ground and starting construction before the end of this calendar year. And it will be, you know, a, a really high end hotel that will be right across the street, you know, from the arena um, with about 200 multifamily units, apartments above it. Right. And then we'll also have an office building on another portion of the property that um, our Orlando Magic headquarters for our business staff will move into, and then we'll have some other tenants. And then we're going to have a significant music venue, indoor music venue, uh, that will be able to accommodate up to 3,500 uh, individuals. Um, and, you know, I would characterize it as the type of music venue that an act is not capable of filling the Kia Center for, but is still very popular you know, that we'll be able to, you know, sell out for a crowd of 3,500 people. Um, and then we'll have a number of restaurants and retail, um, you know, on the street level of the development. So it's very exciting. And, you know, we're going to get started, like I said, before the end of the year. And I think the early portions of the development will open by the end of uh, 2026. And I think the entire development should be done by mid-2027. And uh, as I said at our community gathering last night to celebrate our Sports Business Journal Award for being the number one city uh, for sports destination, um, you know, it'll be just in time for what we hope. I mean, we are working with the NBA to hopefully bring the NBA All-Star Weekend back to Orlando, right? And the next available weekend is in 2028. And so I think that would be perfect timing because... This development will be done and we'll be able to take advantage of it. And, you know, it could end up being, you know, a, a great celebration for our city and bringing the NBA All-Star Weekend back and really showcasing this new development that we're going to have across the street from the Kia Center. Looks like we've got a February 2028 trip at Organizing. Yeah, we then. do, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> well, we got some work to do there yet. You know, we still have to get the, you know, the league to buy in but we're working really hard towards trying to make that happen we'll pencil it in on the diary as provisional okay great <laughs> <laughs> ask ask for permission now paulie yeah absolutely <laughs> <laughs> 
Alex, you've seen everybody come through Orlando in the magic. You know, you Shaq, Penny, T-Mac, Grant Hill, Dwight Howard, the, the superstar names. But who are some of the maybe less heralded names that you, when you think back, that bring back such positive memories to you? You know, we've had so many great players, and, and it's been really special this year in our 35th anniversary because uh, on all of our classic nights, we have honored a former player. You know, and so many of the guys who, you know, were here over the years that certainly I interacted with and had great relationships with, I hadn't seen since that time. And, you know, they've come back this year. But, you know, there, there, there's been, you know, so many great sort of not superstar type names, you know, that have come back that have brought back great memories and, you know, that I enjoyed over the years uh, watching and working with, you know, people like Jameer Nelson, people like Daryl Armstrong. Of course, we have Nick Anderson and Bo Outlaw that still work for us. Um, but, you know, it's it's just been great to see all those guys come back. And, you know, it's heartwarming to me. Almost every one of them, to a man, unprompted, will say to me, you know what? As I look back on my career, this was my favorite place to play. You know, it was just a great community, great ownership. Uh, and, you know, as we, we say here all the time, we think we have the best ownership, not just in the NBA, but in, in all of American professional sports, for sure. Um, it, but, you know, some of those guys, you know, bring back some of the greatest memories. And even like the very first team, you know, that I was a part of back in 1989, you know, just to think back of people like Reggie Theus, who, by the way, is back here in the marketplace and is now the head basketball coach and the athletic director at Bethune-Cookman College in Daytona Beach. Okay, so he's back in the community. Sam Vincent, you know, who was on that original team, you know, is also head basketball coach in Central Florida, you know, for one of the smaller colleges. Um, but even even guys like that, and of course, you know, one guy that's still with us that you know, I always had great memories, I, you know, I call him lefty, but one of the greatest left-handed shooters, I think, of his era, Jeff Turner. You know, um, so th there, there are so many great players that have played, you know, for the Magic over the years, and you know, I'm fortunate enough to, you know, have great relationships with them. You know, we still text back and forth, and we stay in contact with each other. Uh, it's it's a great fraternity. It's a great community uh, of players that have played for us, and the great part about it is, is that, you know, that they don't see themselves as superstars or role players. They see themselves as magic players, you know, and they see themselves as, you know, that was one of the greatest times of my career. One of the times that I had, you know, the, the, the most fun, et cetera. And the other interesting thing is that so many of them come back to central Florida to live after their careers are over. You know, I mean, I just saw Chucky Atkins the other day, you know, who lives, you know, here in central Florida and there's, you know, so many more. So, you know, just great memories, you know, of, the, of our team over the 35 years and, you know, some great players and coaches, you know, who have been with us over the years as well. One final question, Alex, if I can. I remember last time around you were talking to us about um, your love of a certain programme. So we've, we've had Steve Clifford <laughs> as the coach. We have Jamal Mosley at this moment in time. But if we get the opportunity of bringing Ted Lasso in, are you... You're up for that. <laughs> I, I, I love I, I love Ted Lasso. I I guess I've watched it a whole second time since we got together last. Um, you know that seems to be that seems to be my go to. I go I go over you know to 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 Europe and you know to the UK at least once a summer. You know I'm I love to play golf, and um, you know I've got a great friend who's a member at the Old Head in Ireland, so. You know, we get to play there once a year, but we also take clients, um, you know, over. As a matter of fact, our plan this off season is to take some of our top clients uh, to do the British Open uh, oh, wow. circuit around, you know, Hoy Lake and Royal St. Anne's, et cetera. You know, that 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 section of, of England. And um, so anyway, um you know, I, I love the program, but it's my go-to when I fly overseas. It, it seems like that's what I decide to binge on my way, you know, over to Europe or over to the UK. Um, but, 
you know, it, look, it's it's a very it's it was a very inspirational show. I mean, it was brilliant, absolutely brilliantly written, and uh, you know, it, it's a great snapshot into our our world, our industry, you know, and and what it takes to to win, and um, you know, what what great leaders and great players and great performers in our industry uh, are made of, you know. So it's it, it certainly is one of my favorites. Please tell me we are sticking with Jamal. <laughs> <laughs> look, look, I, you know, I'll, I'll I'll finish by saying that you know Jamal is spectacular. Yes, he um, he's you know he's such a connector, he's such a leader. Our players love playing for him. He's a great communicator. Uh, he's very inspirational, and I, I tell you, I mean, even you know the fact that the 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 leadership of USA basketball thinks so highly of him, right? And they've incorporated them into his program. And I personally think that you're going to see him in the USA basketball program for many years to come, but look, look, we're fortunate, very fortunate to have him. Um, And he's done great things. And I think he's going to, you know, do a lot, even greater things, you know, during his career as well. Yes, absolutely. Well, Thank you ever so much, Alex, for you know yeah. taking time out of your extremely busy schedule to talk to us. Uh, we, Always we, we great to be with to, you all. Uh, Any time you want to come on, you're more than welcome to. So, uh, I mean, hopefully now we can uh, make a deep playoff run and maybe we can convince our wives to let us come over for the finals. But <laughs> well, I don't know. I think I've used my credit. <laughs> well, let, let, if, if I can help, let me know. Because okay. if we're in the finals, we'd love to have you here. Oh, Sounds amazing. like a plan. <laughs> Sounds like a plan, Alex. Uh, thank you ever so much again, and you know, uh, keep in touch and uh, have have a wonderful day. Thank you all thank very you. much. Uh, so thanks to Alex for that. That was uh, truly amazing. awesome to have him on the podcast once again. Wow. Um, so we are going to be recording our next episode next Thursday, the 11th of April. We do have another special guest for that one. So uh, watch this space. Should be very good. Um, so that's going to do it for this week. Uh, thank you for listening and watching. Before we go, we just want to say a big thank you to our patrons who help support the show. Uh, thank you for your incredible support to Barry Conn, Paolo and Franz Warmth, Ollie Law, Gary Clark, Angus Craig, Dylan Holden, Alan Kane, Tom Sohn, Mark Joss, Sean Moore, Liam Radbourne, Andy Lindley, Stuart Benzies, Drum, Drum, Drummy, Drum, Drum, and Podfather Phil loves Hazy Northwestern. Love it. Um, if you're interested in joining our Patreon, we have three tiers available with varying benefits. Please visit patreon.com forward slash Let's Talk Magic to join today. Uh, If you enjoyed today's episode, please give it a thumbs up, leave us your thoughts and questions, and don't forget to subscribe. Uh, You can also like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, TikTok, X, or Twitter, whatever you want to call it, at all at underscore Let's Talk Magic. So from Gary, Paul, and myself, until next week, go magic.